Hello Bio20, Mr. Walker here. This lesson is uh, going to be one of three lessons on evolution. There will be another lesson on the mechanism of evolution, another one on the evidence for evolution, and this one here is going to be primarily on the history of evolutionary thought. So a couple of uh, nice little quotations that I've thrown in here for you, first of all, just to give you a feel for the significance of the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. We're going to be talking uh, mostly here about the work of Charles Darwin, the work of Charles Darwin, the father of evolutionary thought, but many, many other figures that I'm going to kind of mention here as well. So these ones are um, fairly recent. Uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky going back to talking to biology teachers in the 1970s, he said some pretty powerful words, nothing in biology makes sense in the site except in the light of evolution. Sir Peter Medawar is a, a British or was a British researcher and he said the alternative to thinking in evolutionary terms is not thinking at all. So if you are a biology student, if you are studying biology, it's really, really difficult to make all of the connections if you don't understand evolutionary theory. And the last one here, American Senator, who said everyone is entitled to his or her own opinion, but not his own facts. So there are things in science that, for the most part, we consider to be truths and facts. For example, the fossil record, it's pretty clear that there are things that were around in the past that are no longer around today when you do take a look at the fossils, and that is what we would call a fact. People are, um, I suppose, entitled to different opinions, different interpretations of that, but some things are facts and the fossils would be considered a fact. So history of evolutionary thought, yeah, it does go back, uh, well, at least 2,500 years, probably the time of the Greek philosophers, not really scientists, but philosophers. And they, I'm sure they were bouncing around ideas that, you know, the plants and the animals, and that's really all they knew about at the time in terms of living organisms. They were thinking, you know, well, maybe they do change. They're not just the same as what they had always been. They're not the same in the past as they were at the time of these philosophers and the idea that maybe they would change again sometime in the future. Jump ahead um, about two millennia to the time of the scientific revolution in the 1500s, the 1600s especially. Things really sort of started to increase in terms of scientific thought and scientific research. Most of this taking place in Europe, much more liberal thinking, much more thinking that, you know, maybe we don't have all the answers. Not Maybe it's not just a matter of going to the local leader or the chief or the pastor or scripture and finding the answer. Maybe there are actually things that we don't know the answer to. So this is a picture here that showing Nicholas Copernicus, and he is the one that did propose the idea that, you know what, maybe the Earth isn't the center of the universe. In fact, it's not even the center of the solar system, but it's the sun. Now, unfortunately, this did go against the major authority at the time, and that was the church, and he kind of paid the price for going against the church, and he was exiled for that. Not executed, fortunately, but exiled. We'll come back and talk um, in a few more slides about this individual here in the early 1800s, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He came up with really the first mechanism in terms of this is how it happens. So most people at the time still, in fact, did not believe that species do change over time. They thought that they were placed on the earth by some sort of divine power, omnipotent being, and they were placed on the earth in that form, and they stayed in that form. But there were certain learned individuals that were starting to think, you know, maybe that's not so much the case. And those ones that thought that it probably wasn't the case were not just Jean Baptiste Lamarck. He was really just kind of summarizing what those individuals at the time would have thought. And what he said was that uh, population species they change because of a desire or a need to change. So again, we'll come back to that and we'll talk about that. He is heavily criticized as being the guy that is wrong, but he is the one that put forth the first proposal for this is how we think it happens, and he does need to be recognized for that. That is the way that science works, remember, is we build upon previous ideas that people have, and this was perhaps the first idea for how traits are passed on. And we'll also come back and look at this. What he said is that it was acquired traits, traits that were acquired throughout an individual's lifetime, in fact, that were passed on to the next generation.
So in the middle part of the 19th century, so beginning around 1830, ending well in the maybe 1860s, 1870s, these two guys here, Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin, appear to have simultaneously developed the mechanism to support evolution, how it does actually happen. And Charles Darwin, he's the one that came up with this name here, natural selection. This is Alfred Russell Wallace, a little bit younger than Charles Darwin. As it turns out, he came up with exactly the same idea. He didn't call it natural selection, but he came up with exactly the same idea. Kind of comical in some ways, he actually sent his manifesto, his ideas to Charles Darwin because Charles Darwin was his hero and kind of said, well, what do you think of it? And Charles Darwin, of course, was, well, a little surprised, I'm sure, to discover that what he had been working on, as we'll see for at least 20 years, is what someone else had just sent him. So a little bit more about Russell Wallace before we get into all the details about Charles Darwin. Um, Charles Darwin was kind of his hero. Charles Darwin did write a book before his famous one called On the Origin of Species. It was called Voyage of the Beagle, and it talked about all of his travels around the globe. And that kind of inspired a number of people, including Alfred Russell Wallace, who went to, well, South America and the Amazon River Basin. And what he did there was make many, many observations, collect many specimens. Most of the scientists at the time had to be independently wealthy or they had to um, be clergy. They had to be part of the church, which gave them the freedom to um, go around and explore and kind of be an amateur naturalist. And if that wasn't the case, you had to have a lot of money and you didn't have to work. So you could, again, sort of spend the time roaming around and exploring and being an amateur naturalist. Well, neither of those were really the case for Alfred Russell Wallace. He had, had to earn his own keep, make his way over to South America and then support his travels around there as well. So what he did is uh, kind of what Charles Darwin did. He killed a whole bunch of things. And what he did is he sent them back to Britain and sold them. And that is how he made his money. Now, unfortunately, when he did himself set uh, sail back to uh, Britain, the uh, ship that he was on with all of the specimens caught fire. It burned and it sank and he himself floated around, bobbed around in the Atlantic Ocean for about 10 days before he was eventually picked up and returned to Britain. So after that, apparently what he said is enough of this. I'm never doing that again. Well, as it turns out, he really had no choice because he had no other means of an income. So where he traveled then was to what is referred to as the Malay Archipelago, which is really Indonesia. This is all Indonesia here, uh, Borneo, Australia down here. We see a little bit of it. New Guinea, this is where he traveled. Not the most hospitable part of the world. And he didn't exactly have a cruise ship to travel on, so he would have to hire fishermen to take him from one island to another, in some cases over very treacherous waters, encountering all kinds of treacherous individuals, civilizations, and people as well and also having to deal with um, various different tropical infections and diseases, including things like malaria that had him uh, laying in bed for weeks and maybe even months at a time throughout his travels through Indonesia and the Malay Archipelago. So it's from here that he did actually send his ideas back to Charles Darwin. It's here that he came up with his mechanism, just like Charles Darwin did. And he did uh, write a book on all of this as well. The title of his book was The Malay Archipelago, telling about all of his travels that he did do. So let's kind of go and talk about the, the main individual in terms of the theory of evolution, and that is Charles Darwin. So we can see that he was born in 1809, and it was in 1831 where he went on a big voyage. It wasn't until 1859 that he published his most famous work. He did publish a number of different books, but this one is by far the most famous. On the Origin of Species, this is a current cover of it in red that we see here. This is the original one, kind of interesting. If you do take a look at the smaller print, which does show you the entire title, it is not just the origin of species or on the origin of species. It is on the origin of species by means of natural selection. That is how he said it happens. And the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. So we'll see more about this, the struggle, the competition that is going on. 
But what some people unfortunately do is they take a look and focus on one word here and they think that he's talking about the preservation of favored human races. In fact, Charles Darwin in his book on the origin of species doesn't really talk about human evolution at all or humans. What he does talk about are plants and animals. And when he says the preservation of favored races, he is actually talking about different species of plants and animals. So a little bit more about Charles Darwin and uh, yeah, who Charles Darwin was. So this is a picture of him in his sort of middle-aged years. This is the boat that he did take his travels on. That is the HMS Beagle. But before that, um, he did grow up in a very wealthy family. He was a physician, a very well-known physician's son. His grandfather was also a physician, Erasmus Darwin. Uh, Darwin, he was also a writer and also had some ideas about evolution himself. Um, Charles Darwin's father, Robert Darwin, wanted Charles Darwin to be a doctor as well. And when he was 16 years of age, he sent him off to the University of Edinburgh to do exactly that. Charles Darwin lasted about two years at the University of Edinburgh. And as it turns out, he wasn't too keen on a couple of things. Blood for one of them. Surgery without anesthetic for another one. So uh, eventually his father kind of got the idea that, yeah, he wasn't all that terribly interested and he needed some other plans for his son. So he sent him off to Cambridge University to study theology. He was religious, and I find that kind of interesting that we have this kind of big controversy in some parts of the world between certain religious groups, uh, not all of them for sure. Certainly the Catholic Church and the Islamic religion, they really don't seem to have any problem with the theory of evolution whatsoever. Others do though, and that does create a little bit of a, an issue. So kind of interesting that he at least initially was very religious, and this is what he did go to university to study, was to be a clergyman, to become a country pastor so he did go through four years of education at Cambridge University, did graduate with an arts degree. And as it turns out, he didn't really appear to want to do that either, was avoiding his father after he graduated and was trying to come up with something else for his lifetime occupation besides being a clergyman. So if we, we'll come back to this slide in a minute, but if we jump ahead here, I um, just want to mention a few kind of major players in terms of influencing Charles Darwin, helping out Charles Darwin in some cases as well, where he perhaps got his inspiration from to figure out where species come from. It's from this guy here. So John Herschel, fairly recognizable scientist at the time of Charles Darwin in the 1820s and 1830s, and he did not believe that species were placed on the earth by some omnipotent being. What he thought is that, yes, they do arise for some other reason. And what he called this was the mystery of mysteries. And it's Charles Darwin that kind of took that on himself to solve what the mystery of mysteries was, where species come from. Charles Darwin made a couple of friends at Cambridge University, and they were a scientist. One of them was John Henslow. He was a botany professor at the University of Cambridge. And in fact, many referred to apparently Charles Darwin at the time as the man who walks with Henslow as they would roam around Cambridge University grounds. Another one here, Adam Sedwich, is a geology professor at Cambridge University. And when Charles Darwin did graduate from Cambridge University, he went on an excursion with Adam Sedgwick to Northern Wales to take a look at geology for about one week. That really was the only formal education that Charles Darwin did have in terms of science. So how to observe, how to collect specimens, how to record this information, that all really came from this week that he did spend on this excursion in Northern Wales. He had been a a naturalist, an amateur naturalist really for his entire life, and he did have a love for it. And it was Hensel that kind of recognized that he did have that passion. The last individual that I have on the slide here, this is the captain of the HMS Beagle. His name is Robert Fitzroy. And when Captain, captain Fitzroy was planning to sail away on this five-year voyage circumnavigating the globe, he was a little bit concerned uh, for himself for one thing. 
And what he was looking for was a gentleman's companion, someone that could that he could have dinner with, someone with intelligence that he could have a an intelligent conversation with. And the way that it worked is the officers did not really associate very much with the sailors on the ship. So he needed someone else in order to keep him company. And that's where he went to uh, John Henslow. And he said, would you like to come along with me and be my naturalist? Well, he was kind of keen on it, but apparently his wife wasn't. So he said, no, but you know what? I have someone else that would be excellent. And surprisingly, it wasn't another scientist. It was Darwin who had very little formal training in science. So Robert Fitzroy, he made the offer to him. Charles Darwin shared this with his father and his father said, no chance that you are doing that. I'm not letting you go. And he gave multiple reasons for not letting them go. And what he did say is, if you can find a man of any common sense who thought that it was a good idea, then I'll let you go. Well, as it turned out, Charles's uncle, Josiah Wedgwood, also a very, very wealthy person in Britain at the time, founder of uh, the English pottery, Wedgwood Pottery. And uh, he was a respected figure and someone that Charles Darwin's father respected. And he said, yeah, I think it would be a good idea for Charles Darwin to go on this voyage. So he went and where he went is, um, yeah, around the globe for five years. So he was 22 years of age when he set sail on this voyage with Captain Fitzroy. Where most of the time was spent was in South America. So starting on the eastern coast of South America, cutting around the bottom, going over to the Falkland Islands, making observations all along the way of plants and animals, taking a look at fossils, discovering that, you know what? Fossils that were around are no longer around today. Things that are around today, plants and animals, they weren't around in the fossil records. So things do change over time. He was also fortunate enough to observe an earthquake taking place and seeing the uplifting and see how these fossils that may have been oceanic fossils, marine fossils, um, end up high at a higher elevation, even as high as up on mountains. We hear a lot about the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador. In reality, Charles Darwin probably had all of the observations that he needed and already had the basic idea behind the fact that populations do change over time before he even reached the Galapagos Islands. So from there, the Beagle did cross the Southern Pacific Ocean, underneath the southern part of Australia, cutting across the Indian Ocean, down around the Horn of Africa, back over to Brazil temporarily, and then eventually five years later, returning to Britain. And Charles Darwin uh, never did set sail on a ship again after that. So it took him a while before he published his book, 1859, before he published his book. As it turns out, taking a look at all of the um, different notebooks that he did keep in the 1830s, what are called the transmutation notebooks, he already had the basic ideas in the 1830s. He had written a sketch in 1842 with he shared with a few people, and it's pretty clear that he had already fully developed his theory by 1842. So when we talk about these two players, Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin, apparently simultaneously coming up with the same mechanism at the same time, taking a look at the history, it's pretty clear that no, that is not the case. Charles Darwin didn't publish first, but he did have the idea first. Who gets recognition is usually who published first. So as it turns out, yeah, they both had their ideas presented at exactly the same scientific meeting, the Royal Society, uh, that information was presented at the same meeting. So in terms of priority, they did both have their ideas presented at the same time, but taking a look at the history behind it in Charles Darwin's notebook, that is why we uh, do give him priority and consider him to be the father of evolutionary thought. So why did it take him so long? Well, first of all, he was probably very, very aware of what happened to Nicholas Copernicus when he went against the church, and Charles Darwin was absolutely going against the church. He didn't have a lot of support. There weren't a lot of people that did believe that species do change over time. There was another individual that anonymously did write 
a mechanism for how populations change over time, which was similar to Charles Darwin's idea of natural selection. His name was John Chambers. It wasn't known at the time, but that was in 1844. And as it turns out, he was totally criticized and slammed for not having a strong case. And Charles Darwin learned for that as well, and probably learned very well that if I'm going to publish something, I better have extremely strong evidence. And that's what he was accumulating over the next 20 or so years. So kind of going back to uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck and to compare the ideas of uh, his earlier mechanism for how populations change over time to the idea of Charles Darwin. And again, it's really the same as Alfred Russell Wallace. What Lamarck said that we saw before is that individuals change because of a need to change because they need to survive in that particular environment, which kind of makes sense. And this is kind of the classic example that we do hear about to explain what Jean-Baptiste Lamarck had said. So the giraffe. So the story is there are many animals that are feeding in the African savanna, giraffe, zebra, wildebeest, gazelle, that are all feeding off of the same, same food. And that's this vegetation down here. But look at all the vegetation that's available up here if you could only reach it. So what Jean-Baptiste Lamarck would say is that the giraffes had a need to change because there wasn't enough food available. So because they had a need or a desire to change to survive in this particular environment, what they did is they stretched their necks. And they stretched their necks more and more and more. And eventually their necks became long. And because they were now long, they can now access that food that was higher up. So in the case of Lamarck, we have this change because they had a need to change. What did Darwin say and Wallace say about these variations that we do see, these different traits that we have? Well, what he said is that organisms change not because of a need to change, not because of a desire to change, but they just change whether they want to or not. Charles Darwin and no one at the time knew about genetic information, knew about DNA and chromosomes and proteins or anything like that. They didn't know about mutations. They didn't use the word mutation. A mutation today is a change to the genetic instructions. If you change genetic instructions, genetic instructions, the DNA, are used to make proteins. And proteins are what are responsible for different traits that we do see or observe in the organism. So if we do take a look at this moose, this moose is a different color than most moose. Most moose are brown. This one here is white. So how does that happen? Well, in today's language, we would say that there are genetic instructions for coat color, genetic instructions that result in a protein being produced that gives them the brown coloration. This moose here had a mutation. That information in the DNA did not produce this brown pigmentation, so it ends up being white in color. So why did this happen? Well, it's not because the moose wanted to be white in color. It just happened. These mutations just happen. And what it does lead to is variation. So this moose is different than the other ones. And mutations are the source of these variations. But now that we have these variations, now natural selection can come into play. What does natural selection really kind of mean overall? Nature is selecting for those individuals that have favorable variations. So in the case of this moose, it is not very favorable. It's not going to survive. So that's what we would call a deleterious trait. So ones that have the favorable traits, nature will select for them. Those are the ones, as we'll see, that are going to be able to survive. So continuing on, what else did Lamarck say? Well, he said that if there are some structures or organs that you're not using for a period of time, they will eventually disappear. And here we're not talking about evolutionary time over thousands of years and thousands of generations. He was talking about in the individual, if they are not used for a period of time, they will disappear. And where everything really kind of falls apart for him is acquired traits. He said acquired traits can be passed on to the offspring. And as it turns out, that's not really the case. Although, as we'll see, there may be a little bit of a twist on that. Recently, some research into what is referred to as epigenetics may kind of go back and 
give Jean-Baptiste Lamarck a little bit of credit for saying acquired traits can be passed on. But for the most part, we take a look at that and say, well, no, that just doesn't happen. So if you go into the gym, you work out, you get the big muscles like a bodybuilder here, acquired trait is what it is. And according to Lamarckian evolution, that means that babies would be born from this bodybuilder and they would also be muscular like this as well. And that, of course, we know is simply not the case. So what about Darwin? That struggle for existence, competition, the moose, individuals that are best suited to the environment will survive and reproduce. Ones like the moose will not survive and reproduce. So ones that do survive and reproduce will, of course, pass that trait on to the next generation. What kind of a trait was that? Well, that wasn't an acquired trait. The moose didn't over time become white. It was born white. So that is a genetic trait, what it was born with in the first place. If it happened to make that moose more likely to survive and reproduce, it would be passed on to the next generation. But that, of course, simply would not be the case when we're talking about that white moose. So we would say that the white moose is simply not fit in that environment. So in terms of fitness, survival of the fittest individuals would be the ones that are able to gain camouflage from predators. And the white moose, of course, would not be able to.